Kyle Rittenhouse, the then 17-year-old who shot and killed two people and wounded another during a Black Lives Matter protest in Wisconsin last August, took the stand in his own murder trial today. He and his attorneys tried to paint a picture of a scared kid who was there to help defend property but ended up fearing for his own life. I was cornered from in front of me with Mr. Zeminski and there were <laughs> there were three people right there. On August 25th of 2020, did you come to downtown Kenosha to look for trouble? No. But the prosecution argued that wasn't the case at all, questioning his reasons for going to Kenosha with his AR-15 style weapon, which he was too young to legally carry there, by the way, and his intentions when he fired. A line of questioning that prompted a repetitive, very carefully worded response from Rittenhouse. I intended to stop the people who were attacking me. By killing them? I did what I had to do to stop the person who was attacking me. By killing them? Two of them passed away, but I stopped the threat from attacking me. The defense also did its best to portray those who Rittenhouse shot as threatening figures, benefiting from a pretrial ruling that let the defense call them rioters, arsonists, and looters, but barred prosecutors from calling any of them victims. That's just one of many troubling elements my next guests see in this case, as well as the trial of Ahmad Arbery's killers who are claiming self-defense, which they've laid out in an op-ed for the Chicago Sun-Times titled, America Should Not Tolerate vigilante behavior. Nancy Gertner is a retired federal judge, now a senior lecturer at Harvard Law School. Dean Strang is a Loyola University Chicago law professor, criminal defense lawyer in Madison, Wisconsin, also known for representing Stephen Avery in the murder trial feature in the Netflix series, Making a Murderer. Dean, it's really good to see you. Judge Gertner, thanks for being here. Good to be here. Judge, can, here. can we start with you? What's the common thread that the two of you weave through the defense of Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, through the defense of the killers of uh, Ahmed Arbery, and actually even all the way back to the case of George Zimmerman, who people remember killed Trayvon Martin? Well, in, in each case, the defendant in question is saying, I was doing this, I was sort of proactively doing what I did um, it, because I thought the guy was committing a crime. And, and that was the implication of the, and the judge was sort of allowing that implication by saying that the defense could call the victims looters, arsonists, imply, and, and at one point the judge even said, you know, I want you to, um, you know, you, you, you can basically tell the story, you can cast doubt on the story by calling them looters, arsonists, arsonists etc. And what that does is to imply that it's okay to shoot people who are committing crimes when you're a civilian. And in the, in the Aubrey case, there's actually a, a statute that enabled citizens' arrests. But Dean knows more about that than I. Well, I want to stay on your basic theme, though, as well. It would seem to me that what uh, Judge Gertner just described, Dean, in the case of uh, in the killing of Arbery and the killing of uh, Trayvon uh, Martin, the additional factor in the defense in this Rittenhouse case is not just protecting property, but self-defense. They're trying to make the case pretty powerfully. And I actually think they've made it with some of the, even the prosecution's own witnesses, that the people he ended up shooting were people who were about to shoot him. No, doesn't that distinguish this case a little bit? It may, it may, a jury may decide that. The, and neither Nancy nor I are here to say who's guilty or not guilty yeah. or, or to comment directly on the evidence and what the jury's got to do. I think our point is legitimate self-defense has to be distinguished from provoking the violence that you then fear. Um, if you're the one who, by legal activity, provokes the dangerous situation that you then encounter, it's very difficult to get back or to, or to have arise now a right of self-defense properly understood. Um, so to me, what ties these cases together is what appears to be provocation by the person then later claiming a right to self-defense, and that at least should be a very heavy lift. 
Dean, describe to me, use the term, I can't remember, either legitimate or legal self-defense. What is legal or legitimate self-defense, according to you? The, the formulation is going to vary a little bit from state to state, but the basic idea in U.S. law and, and indeed English law is that you have a privilege to use reasonable force if you perceive reasonably an imminent threat to yourself. That reasonable force can be up to and including deadly force, but only if you reasonably perceive an imminent threat of death or great mm -hmm. bodily harm to yourself. And the, the point I think we're trying to make is you can't provoke that and then, and then argue, well, I had to use self-defense to avoid it. You know, Judge Gertner, I want to go back to what I said in the, uh, the lead that I borrowed from the op-ed you two wrote about the language that the judge in his earlier rulings permitted to be used and not permitted uh, to be used. Can you describe it yet again and tell me whether you think that essentially almost lays the foundation for uh, Kyle Rittenhouse's lawyers to do what you both believe they shouldn't be able to do? What, what he, the judge said that the um, prosecutor could not call the people who were shot victims, which was a, a, a stunning in and of itself. Um, but the defense of Rittenhouse could call the people he shot looters, arsonists, etc. The implication of that is that he, that they he was essentially saying the defense can claim that he was justified because these people would, were disobeying the law, that it was justified. And that is precisely what you cannot do. We don't have citizens' arrests in this country, and certainly there's no such thing in Wisconsin, but there isn't that around. You don't arrogate. One of the points we were making more broadly is that, you know, we've been dealing with cops who have been in it, who have shot people believing that they were endangered or protecting others. And cops are at least trained on how to use weapons. The notion that you privilege a 17-year-old to do the same is extraordinary. I want to stay with you for a second. We actually do have states that allow citizens arrest. I mean, Georgia undid their law after right. the uh, Ahmed Arbery case. But uh, Judge Gertner, in the years you were on the bench, was there ever a circumstance in which you uh, prevented a, uh, the use of the term victim uh, by the prosecution ever? Never. Never. I mean, it was, in fact, it's seen as a sort of pretty, um, you know, anodyne word for, for describing someone. In fact, Dean and I were trying to think about where there are other cases involving domestic violence, for example, in which the judge would have no problem talking about victims. But it's really, it's not an epithet. Looter arsonist is an epithet, and he's allowing one side to indulge in that and the other side not. But do you not think, despite the fact, staying with you for one second, Judge Gertner, that you never did it and you don't think it's appropriate in a self-defense case, which again is part of what Rittenhouse is saying in this case, you don't think that term is more loaded than you both are describing it to be? Victim? The word victim is loaded? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, it's loaded. I mean, I suppose it's loaded, but there isn't a jury in the world that doesn't understand um, that to one side, as we say in our op-ed, to one side he's a victim, and the other side it was someone who was, uh, you know, engaging in violence as to whom the response was appropriate. So it's not it's loaded, but it can be unloaded and unpacked pretty soon. Allowing the defense to caricature the people that were shot in any, this is a character that says they were doing something wrong and therefore yeah. deserved to be shot. That's the problem. Dean, so what's the, if you're both concerned, which I know you are about vigilante justice, and I'm hoping everybody watching the show tonight is concerned about vigilante justice, where does the solution lie, in the courtroom or in legislatures? Well, in, in the short term, it lies in any courtroom where that issue is played out. In the long term, I don't, I'm not sure it's a legislative problem, it's a cultural problem here. And I think, you know, to be clear, Jim, to go back, um, the, the, the word victim is, is it's an argument. It, it's an argument you expect a prosecutor to make. It is, of course, true that in the end, and Nancy and I acknowledge this, in the end, juries decide who's a victim and who's not a victim. 
are, are it's at least speaking for myself, the real concern here is tilting in the defense favor the, the argumentative advantage or the rhetorical advantage by removing the argument from the prosecutor that you have victims on the one side. But if the defense can point to some evidence, enabling the defense to use really inflammatory rhetoric in describing the people uh -huh. who were shot. And that sort of skew in the argumentation of a case, I, I think it may be subtle, it may be too subtle for a mass audience, but um, it concerns me here um, with, with the way in which this trial is being conducted. Dean, I want to take issue with your notion that there, about, there may not be a legislative solution. It may not be realistic, but it seems to me that these citizens' arrest laws, which do exist, as I said, in a number of states, though no longer in Georgia, and the infamous stand your ground uh, uh, laws, uh, like the one that uh, George Zimmerman used in his defense in the killing of Trayvon Martin, they are the root of the problem. They provide the foundation, do they not, to allow what you consider to be, in some circumstances, vigilante justice, no? Let's take those two things separately. First, uh, citizens' arrest statutes are long outdated and dangerous if indeed they ever had any mm -hmm. legitimate purpose. I think it was a racially loaded and racially yeah. intended statute at the time to allow white people to control black people. Today, in my view, police powers ought to be exercised by the police. And we ought to be focusing on how they exercise police powers. The idea that a 17 year old, or for that matter, a 57 year old is out self-appointed exercising police powers of arrest is terrible. So those statutes should go. The stand your ground idea, and I'm not a fan of those statutes, but that's really just setting the balance on self-defense. And we're distinguishing any form of self-defense here from provoking the very danger that you then claim you've got to react to in self-defense. You know, uh, Judge Gertner, I am uh, not an historian, and I'm surely not a legal historian, but when I was thinking about the two of you coming on the term vigilante justice, the first thing that occurred to me was not these criminal cases, but the Texas abortion law. And I sort of stepped back, and we've discussed this ad nauseum on the show, obviously, where there is vigilante justice, because people can, they're bounty hunters, essentially, statutorily empowered under that law. It, is there a, an inverse proportion be, relationship between people's lack of respect for their governments at certain time, which seems to be at a high point, and the, the rise of vigilante justice, whether it is in the form of violence or in the form of this Texas abortion law, or am I trying to make a connection that doesn't exist? Well, I, I, think, um, I think the Texas abortion law was much more canny than that. It was not a concern about citizen justice. It was a. It was absolutely a way of avoiding review. Yeah. By doing it the way that it was avoiding review, uh, the Rittenhouse and Arbery and Trayvon Martin's case are more uh, the combination of guns, uh, combinations of guns, the sort of fluidity of what comprises what, what the, of the self-defense defense. defense you know, and then you add to it the stand your ground and the combination enables someone to say, I mean, Arbery is a classic example. Black guy running through a white neighborhood, he must be up to no good. Yeah. My God, if that's sufficient, then uh, it, then we're we are courting anarchy. So before we go, let me ask you the same question, Judge, that I asked Dean a minute ago. Where does the solution lie? Courtroom, legislature, where? Well, clearly, um, that's not an easy thing to answer. So clearly get eliminating formal citizens arrest statutes has, occur, has occurred in Georgia, absolutely. Uh, uh, redoing stand your ground, uh, one, that's one thing. Um, but ultimately the problem here is that the language of self-defense uh, comes back over the decades as common law concept, allowing you to respond with deadly force when you believe reasonably yeah. that you're encountering deadly force. And the problem is that the way to implement that is through juries, and juries come to the table with all their prejudices. And I think we're seeing play, seeing that play out in the Rittenhouse case. 
Judge Gertner, as always, thanks so much. And Dean Strang, it's been a long time. It's good to see you. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having us. Thank you.